Hi, my name is Anthony Simpkins. I'm here in Detroit, Michigan at Razzie Manufacturing, a real historical spot here in Detroit. Uh, the shop's been here since 1946. Before that, they were uh, building Indy cars in the 30s, all the way up until doing race cars up until about 75, we just found out. And this is kind of like a historical treasure trove of race car stuff. And we're going to kind of take you around and show you the innovations that the Razzie family had come up with during their racing career. This is the very first tether car. This was built in 1936, and Chuck's father built this while they were developing the Wasp aircraft engine in Long Beach, California. This is uh, taken from the 1926 Miller Indianapolis race car. Uh, Chuck actually has a brochure that this car was built off of. And the unique part about this car, just like a real Miller car, Dan, if you can get an underneath shot, it's got a front wheel drive, real leaf springs. The thing has, runs a little aircraft engine, which was built by Dean Might. He was the actor in Poncho Kid. He was Poncho and the Cisco Kid. He was Poncho and Cisco Kid. And he, before he was an actor, he built little aircraft engines. And Chuck's dad and him was buddies when they were out in California. That little fuel tank back here? Yep. Yep, it's got the little fuel tank, actual side exhaust. But this thing, every inch of this thing is absolutely highly detailed and just gorgeous. But it's built just like a Miller Indianapolis race car. Chuck's father and Chuck were way ahead of their time when it comes to small aircraft engines. This was being built for a plane, and it literally is a hand-built of a chunk of billet Offenhauser, like they would have ran in an Indy car. And this little Offenhauser, look down in there, Dan, you can see little glow plugs. Mm -hmm. Dual overhead cam, it's just like the real Offenhauser. The crankcase even mimics an Offenhauser. And this was something that they were passionate about. And I guess they had it running, it actually runs. They got spare parts in here, they got little rods, pistons for it. But I just think it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And like, like I say, they were before anybody. You can see these little V8 engines and all that now, but these guys were really ahead of their time. Now this is Chuck Razzie's dad, the one responsible for all this. And this is their Indy car, Detroit uh, car shippers. And right after this was taken, unfortunately, Shorty, their driver, was killed in an accident. But the car has been restored, and we think this is the one that has the Miller V16 that they bought during the 1943 auction when they auctioned off Miller's stuff. And one of the only things that was sold outside the auction to an individual was this engine. And he actually was able to finish the engine by using white truck engine bearings. We're back with our next item. This, believe it or not, is the 1958 Hurricane that they had built. And they went into building quarter midgets. We're going to show you some parts that are literally left over from 1960s. Um, there's some cars they never finished. And the parts are literally hanging in here yet. We'll show you that in a minute. But this car here, believe it or not, ran in the world uh, quarter midget race that took place in the Bahamas. And this car actually won it. And this is the very first car, actually, that was produced in 1958. And after this, they started manufacturing these. And there was a series of cars before this one. But unfortunately, we don't have anything to show you that. But um, this was the uh, very first, 1958. They went on to build these for quite a few years. I think probably uh, 62, 63, I think, they ended production. And um, there's a fellow by the name of Elliot Cohen. They contacted the Razzies and he actually had these built for his drive-in theater so kids could race during intermission. And I actually ran Elliot Cohen down a few years ago and um, they had uh, Chuck and his father had built him a special car. And I found out he actually still had the car. And he built a private track on uh, Mackinac Island and you're not really supposed to have a motorized vehicle but he had snuck it on the island because he owns like 50 acres of un. Uh, basically developed land and he built a racetrack up there and he loved that car and he still had it and uh, so yeah these are pretty impactful little cars around the Detroit area now most go-karts have just a shaft that goes down and then it just has an arm that pulls the wheels left to right not this car this car literally has a real rack and pinion in it Chuck's dad went ahead and developed a rack and pinion steering for these cars so that not do they they also steer very precise but they drive excellent because it's just everything on it was done with an Indy car in mind. So these were re really, really, really ahead of their time. These are really fantastic race cars. 
Now, the unique part about this uh, this quarter midget that the Razzies produced, these had real knockoff wheels. So these spinners, they are real knockoffs, just like the Indy cars would have had. This is an example of the tire that they produced. And you can see how they put a cap on it. And this is literally Razzie's own slick right here they built. And then the other unique part about this quarter midget is it has a Volkswagen style knee action suspension with a torsion bar. It had a lot of configurations, but the Razzie's by far was the simplest to adjust and the simplest to maintain and it worked beautifully. Oh, 15, 20 years ago maybe now, it's been a little bit ago. But the mini bikes always had like a two piece wheel off the rubs and that. He had uh, some clients that uh, needed different wheels and stuff for their mini bikes because mini biking in Detroit got so big. And this is a two piece wheel that he offered, solid billet. I mean, it's just a work of art. And he sold these for quite a while. He still, we just ran into these. He's still got some left. And uh, they're beautiful wheel. They're all built, you can see in here. Now this one here, Dan. It's got some bearings in it. Bearings are in that, yeah. That's a, that's a cast wheel. That's an original. I think that's a, that might be a billet, I don't know. I think that's a cast wheel right there. What he, what he mocked it off of. He's got, He's got a, a set of the slicks up here on the top shelf. Those would have been slicks for a hurricane. You got the larger yeah. rear, oh my God. larger rear brand tires new. and the smaller uh, I've never seen these. fronts and they're brand new, never been run. Still sitting on the shelf. Here we go. Oh, they are brand new. Still got the little nubs on them. Like I said, the Razzies were very innovative people. I mean, they, they'd come up with all kinds of stuff to help themselves in racing. One of the things they did for themselves, they didn't make slick tires back then when they were racing quarter midgets. They actually made their own slick tire. And how they did it was they'd take a knobby tire that you could buy for a go-kart, they'd literally grind off the tread, and then they would put the tire in here, he would induce hot liquid rubber, and then he would hit it with a like a coolant that was very, very cold. And what that would do, that would vulcanize a cap right onto their tire. So th these guys not only made race cars, they made their own tires. And that's how innovative the Razzies were. And they did this up until the time they quit racing. So if you're running a quarter midget and you're running a slick tire out there, you can thank the Razzies. They're the first ones that really developed this technology for racing on asphalt. So we can thank them for that. Item up here is the uh, actual mold for the race car. This is a hurricane mold. It's a two-piece mold. So they would go in and they would put their fiberglass resin in and their and their uh, the matting. And then when it cured and it hardened, you actually unbolt this and you pull it in half, and then your body would be left. And Chuck actually recently, not too long ago, actually updated the mold um, from the original one and made it much easier with a split in half piece. Because he, uh, we talked him into remaking these things about 15 years ago. We were here and said, man, Chuck, you ought to finish up the ones you never finished. And he did do about six of them, and uh, they sold for really good money. And this was just to help him with that process. So uh, we're real fortunate Chuck was able to, to let us in here and show us this stuff today. We're here with our next item in the Razzie Museum. Um, these here, these bars that are hanging here, believe it or not, they've been here since 1962. These are basically the cars he didn't finish. And this is what's left. So you have roll cages and you have the Nerf bars. And they're still here since, they've been here since 1962. Look right above it, you see a mold for an old uh, midget car. Yep. On the shelf. Absolutely, you'd be surprised. That probably find. is the original, not the Hurricane, I'm guessing. Well, we got more parts over here, Dan. Or, right? Uh, no, this would have looks been like the, the seat. cockpit area the where cockpit. the seat is. Yeah, the cockpit cage. Look at this. Here's a front bumper. Get that. That's bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like Shall that. I buy some of this stuff. That's bad. And then this would have been this would have been the front bumper, maybe the back. Back bumper, I think. Yeah. Welcome back. Anyway, our next item here is a uh, little Continental engine. Now, this engine is what they ran in those quarter midget race cars we were showing you earlier. We didn't know Chuck had this set in here, so we wanted to showcase the Continental. Now these motors started out about a three horse, and by the time Chuck's dad was done with them in the A class, they could get about 30 horse out of these. Turn about seven to 8,000 RPM. They even had a dyno here uh, for developing. 
and they were out of uh, motor companies out of Detroit, Continental Engines, and this is what was called the gearbox, and this allowed you to basically push start the race car. <laughs> and uh, a lot of hot rod guys out in Southern California, believe it or not, made a lot of parts for these. And this one here's got the very unique twin carb, which is rare. But uh, we just wanted to showcase the engine and show you what they ran those little quarter minute race cars. Next up is the connecting rod. Now, Chuck kind of had me thinking for a little bit when he showed me these. He has a cutaway of one of these. In one of these racks right here, there's a cutaway. And what it is, these are round rods. This one here is not quite finished. This is it in its raw. But this rod is hollow. So it means it's extremely strong. Is that it, Dan? That's hollow. Yeah, you can see it. See up the end of that, it's hollow. So when they're finished, you can't tell they did it because they put a plug in the end of this and they use about a 10 thousandths press. So when you do something like that, <clears throat> the friction's so hot that literally they kind of mold together. It makes it very tough to see how he did that. But his dad made forgings. Now what's cool about these rods, he made big block and small block. Now for Chevrolet. So the big blocks ones were used in Greenwood, the guy that run the Corvettes back in 1970, won a lot of the road races. That big block made a thousand horse. I don't know if too many guys are making a thousand horse for the aspirated big block back in the day, but Razzies were, and they were doing it because they had the strongest rod on the market at the time. The hollow rod, just so strong, you could just turn it and turn it and it was fine. Now what's cool is this right here, it's hard to see, but this right here is actually a little rod balancing machine that they developed to balance these rods. So everything was here that they needed to make these rods work. And that's why I say these people were really amazing, amazing people. And one of the things we'd like to showcase is a 1962, and it's a C-class car. And this is one of the next to the last cars that they had built and competed with. And this actually had a Vega Cosworth in it. It ran a Volkswagen transmission, and it's just a piece of history. And Chuck had just got this back not too long ago. They'd been up in New York in a collector's collection, and the gentleman reached out to him to have some race car parts remanufactured, and Chuck had found out that he still had this car. And the gentleman was kind enough to go ahead and make it happen. And Chuck got it back. So we're here just taking a look at it today because uh, this is something new for me. So... Kind of exciting to see. We're here with our next item that we wanted to show off. This is Chuck and his father. They built this car in 19, about 1970, they started on it. This is kind of a unique car. The bodywork here is actually covering a car like your C-Class car, but they changed the rule in 1974, so they had to actually come up with a body. So they actually built the body over the other chassis to make it legal. Unique thing about this car is they added the wings for the 75 season in the Atlantic 5000 series, but they added the side pods for safety. The side pods not only added safety, but it gave Chuck, he come up with an idea of putting radiators in the side pods. And that was Chuck Razzie's idea. And then he said by the year end, everybody had the idea. It ran a small block Chevy and this thing was capable about 215 mile an hour back then. The guy that bought it and restored it, went to race it, had to slow it down. So this is a very cool car that they built. And this would have been the last race car the Razzies had built in this shop. They built it literally in this shop. Right where you're standing. Right where I'm standing. So we wanted to showcase this car. It's a very cool piece. Here's another treasure that we just dug up from the Razzie family. Um, years and years ago in the 30s and 40s at Indy, they would line up all the movie stars, all the crews, all the drivers, all the personnel at Indy, and they'd take these wonderful shots. This is um, this is what's called living right. It's the 20th and, Indianapolis 500 yeah. in 1932 at the 32. Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Brickyard. Yep, yeah. and this would have been during the Depression, and they still uh, managed to get the race off. And I do believe Clark Gable's in this photograph somewhere. Clark was in a lot of these. scanning the faces so you can kind of mm -hmm. see that's cool see the era that this was in it's another time for sure mm -hmm. 
And if you look close, you can see some of the cars way back here. Oh yeah. That uh, were not all that different from the Miller designs. Well, this would have been Miller. Yeah. At the end of Miller, actually. Some of the grandstands. Mm -hmm. And then the China, uh, the Japanese influenced tower. Mm -hmm. So we do have an example of the very first Razzie quarter midget. This would have been around 1952, Chuck was telling us. Uh, Razzie special. And you can see the cowling here is a much taller in the back. Where they made it a little more streamlined, a little more longer. But they still had the knockoff wheels. And it was before they made the tire machine. Because this one has the knobbies on it. So this would have been, like I said, in about 1952. And the knockoffs were slightly different. They yeah, they were a little different. Yep. Yeah. They almost look like a Chevy bow tie. And mm -hmm. these ones have three. Yeah, we'll show you this one. Now, this is one of the cars that... It's a hurricane there. Hurricane that my buddy and I talked Chuck into uh, go ahead and finishing up. And this is one of those. And I do believe it went to Colorado to an Indy car collector. Uh, but I remember this car when I was up here one day. He had just gotten it done. Well, in closing, we just want to thank Chuck here for letting us in and uh, showing us around again. And every time I come here, I learn something new and find something new. So it's always an amazing time. And it's such a time capsule. You could literally look through artifacts for hours here. It's just a really neat place. Real treasure. So uh, thanks a lot, Chuck, for having us, and we appreciate it. So thanks for watching. all done all right hope you guys enjoyed the chuck Razzie story i love going to that place and i want to thank dan black for taking us up there and being able to see chuck and see the new race car i thought that was pretty awesome that's why we thought hey we ought to film this capture it you know hopefully i can get better about that i go to so many unique places with so many cool stories uh but i've been blessed in that honestly but I wanted to share a couple things in closing that you guys may not know about the Razzies also, which is pretty cool. One of the things is this picture right here. And this is of actually uh, Bill Bixby. The, uh, Hawk, uh, what do you call it? Hawk. Yeah, 1976, there was this uh, show called The Incredible Hawk. Yeah, this is a Bill Bixby. Actually, before he was a movie star, you know, acted with Elvis Presley and all that and Incredible Hawk. He actually hung out at Razzie's taking pictures of the race cars and making brochures. I've seen some of the pictures they had done. And man, they're fantastic. Very cool. I mean, he brought in some models and stuff. And I mean, they, I'm telling you, man, they did it all. It was awesome. So I thought that was pretty cool. That's actually Bill Bixby right there sitting in the, sitting in a little race car. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Wanted to share it with you. And the other thing here real quick is I did find a brochure I had on the old Razzie Rocket. This would have been the 1952 car, the trifold brochure, and it's got all the pricing in that. We'll try and get that online maybe for you guys. You can take a look. But pretty nice little brochure. Shows the inside of the car, the inner workings. Um, you could have bought a motor for them, built anything you wanted, painted, unpainted, however you wanted to buy it. Very cool, 1952. A couple other things about, the, about Chuck Razzie's father that's very cool. The first time I met Chuck, he actually uh, walked up to me and he said, Hey, you know, I'm glad to meet you. My name's Chuck Razzie. And he said, Shake the hand that shook the hand of Clark Gable. And I'm like, Man, that is a cool way of thinking about it. Because he said, You never know whose hand has touched whose hand. And I asked Chuck one day, I said, hey, would you have any old footage, like 8 millimeter or anything, that your dad would have took of racing? He goes, I think I do. I'm trying to find it. I got it in a CD. I want to get it out there. But I actually have a video of Clark Gable at Indianapolis that no one's ever seen. So we do have some really cool footage. Hopefully we can get that out. And the other thing that was really cool about Chuck's dad is he worked on Amelia Earhart's airplane, the one at Smithsonian. 
He he actually also helped out Admiral Byrd on the tri the what is that Ford tri motor that went up to I do believe the North Pole South Pole. Admiral Byrd, look it up. Great story. But anyway, he knew these people personally. He worked under aircraft. I think all that took place when he was on Long Beach uh, prior to him coming back to Detroit to build the Indy cars. So they have a great, great history. So if we get anything else, we'll update, we'll let you know. So please hit the like button and subscribe, and we're bringing you more material. We got uh, Fran Hernandez we're trying to run down, and that brings me to the last story, actually, and that's the tether car. The te little yellow tether car, tether car was actually responsible for top fuel drag racing. When Chuck's dad was coming back to Detroit, he stopped at Dueling Brothers Toy Company, and they made toys. Well, he said, hey, you ought to make this little uh, tether car. I don't know what he called it, but they ended up being called tether cars or drones. And he said, you, you know, this would be something you guys could sell. Them. So he showed them a the little car, and they said, no, we're not interested. Well, after he left, unfortunately, they stole the idea, and they made these tether cars. And Fran Hernandez which is a famous hot rodder, street racer, worked for Vic Elderbach. Um, guy, he was part owner of Offenhauser with Fred. On and on and on. Great story, and I'm going to bring that story to you. Just happens to be, Fran was moved here by Ford Motor Company, and through weird events, I'm, I'm writing a screenplay for a movie, friend reached out to me and said, hey, I met this guy, might be somebody you want to know about for your movie, and man, was he right. So, Fran, unfortunately, when I first ran into the family, Fran was in pretty bad shape. He, he was in an old folks home, and he was struggling with some dementia and stuff, and they asked that I didn't bother him, and I respectfully didn't. And that's what we're asking for people about Chuck. Be respectful. Don't bother him. So, I didn't bother him. But the, the, his wife was willing to meet with me and, inter and let me interview her, and that's when I learned about the little tether car. And it being responsible for top fuel drag racing. So what had happened was he went to work for Dueling Brothers at 18, which would have been about 1930, what did Chuck say, 38, right around in there? And don't hold us to the dates. <laughs> we're talking a long time ago, but we're close. We're right in the area. So what had happened was once he started working there and finishing up the cars, he had to run the cars. And he asked him, what do I put in it, you know, to fire these up? What fuel are you running? They go, nitromethane. He goes, man, he said, uh, run pretty good and easy. He goes, makes these little two-strokes flip out. Yeah, they run awesome. He says, you think that'll work in a four-stroke? Don't know. So he bought some, took it home, figured I could run 25% mix of nitromethane in his flathead Ford, not blow the guts out of it. Won a lot of street races. And he took that technology and what he had learned to, to uh, Vic Elderbach, and then they started winning with their midgets at Ascot Park and at some other places. So... That worked out really, really well, and then it led to top fuel drag racing. So just wanted to share that with you. Uh, in closing, I want to thank everyone for coming in and checking us out. And until we meet again, my name is Tony Simpkins. Thank you.